I probably wouldn't have been so annoyed by the sound of the doorbell if I hadn't just turned on the football game and sat down with a beer. With my wife and three daughters out shopping for prom dresses, I had the rare opportunity to spend a Saturday watching sports without interrupting housework. Such a case deserved my full attention. I headed for the door, secretly praying for the instant and painful death of all Mormons and sellers of whatever. Preparing to rush to get rid of my unwanted guest, I slammed the door open, only for my bad mood to become much worse. I don't think you've become a Mormon, do you? Were the first words that came out of my lips when I looked closely at my ex-wife for the first time in more than 18 years. To say that Vivian was a little embarrassed by my first salvo would be an understatement, as she just stood there with her mouth open. I spotted the late episode Mercedes in my driveway and the small boulder she still wore as a wedding ring and assumed she remained married to Dr. Jerry Spaulding. Vivian seemed to recover slightly from her dazed state when she finally answered. No, Thomas, I'm not a Mormon, she stated as we both looked at each other. Why on earth would you ask that? Well, I answered seriously. This is perhaps the only thing that could make everything even worse. Why are you here, Vivian? Vivian suddenly seemed unsure of herself, and I took the opportunity to compare this latest version with the Vivian I had known all these years. At 44, Vivian was still a beautiful woman, her long blonde hair now a stylish shoulder length, and her figure now a fuller version of the lithe young woman I had fallen in love with during my freshman year of college. The lines that had always been at the corners of her mouth now seemed to point a little downward, and the green eyes that had initially captivated me seemed a little sadder, but otherwise she was just an older version of my first love. I was wondering if I could talk to you about Benjamin, Vivian ventured, her eyes meeting mine in a kind of quiet plea. I noticed she was twirling her fingers, and for the first time, I realized how nervous she was about coming to me. Why would I want to talk to you about Benjamin after all these years? I asked incredulously. Well, he's still your son, Vivian said hastily, as if trying to convince me of this statement. Her eyes left mine as she saw the momentary flash of rage. My son, I roared. You have the nerve to come here after what you did to me and say that. I was actually spluttering, drops of saliva flying out of my mouth as anger consumed me. I knew it was a bad idea, Vivian muttered, turning away from me. I just had to try. Surprisingly, I heard my wife's voice in my head. Allison, who pulled me out of the broken, bitter wreck that I was and helped me rebuild my life so that I could be proud of myself, was like standing next to me and calming me down. Talk to her. End it. Before Vivian could get off the porch, I called out to her. Viv, wait, we need to talk. She turned to me as I waved her towards the open door. Let's go inside and sit down. Vivian approached me cautiously and walked through the door, taking in the atmosphere of a middle-class family home built around three precocious young women. I led her into the kitchen and started making coffee as she sat down at the kitchen table. Still cream, no sugar, I asked, preparing our coffee. In response to her affirmative nod, I finished and handed her the mug. Sitting down opposite her, I launched the ball. So, tell me what's going on. Well, Vivian began carefully. As you probably know, Ben has always been a complete punishment, but in the last few years, he has become much worse. I interrupted her before she continued. How do I know that Ben has problems? I haven't been interested in you or Ben since you left when he was less than a year old until today. Vivian seemed a little surprised by my statement, although I had no idea why. Between her and her rich doctor boyfriend, my access to Benjamin was a battle I couldn't and wouldn't win. I just thought that you would try to keep up with what was happening in his life. Vivian slowed down and stopped, seeing from the expression on my face that this attack of hers did not lead to anything. I just want to say how sorry I am for the way I handled our breakup, she tried again, staring at her still nervously intertwined fingers. I never had any intention of hurting you. 
She looked up. Anyway, over the last few years, Ben has been in trouble for a variety of reasons. Stealing, fighting, and most recently, illegal substances. She sighed, as if preparing herself for what she was about to tell me. Two weeks ago, he got into a fight and beat up another guy very badly. There were drugs and guns and... Well, now that he's 18, they want to charge him as an adult. There were tears in her eyes as she looked at me again. Jerry abandoned him and didn't even hire a lawyer to defend him. He says Ben deserves to go to jail for everything. For everything. Maybe you. Vivian stopped, and I offered her a tissue to wipe her eyes. I know I have no right to ask you after everything that happened, but I can't stand the thought of him in this terrible prison. He really is a sweet boy. He just... I allowed Vivian to slow down and stop. Her breathing was ragged as she tried to control her emotions. Vivian looked at me, waiting for my answer as I took a sip of coffee. I stared out the window for a moment, wondering what to tell her. Vivian, do you remember the movie Trading Places? I asked, looking at the calming panorama of my backyard. Vivian was confused again when she answered, You mean the one with Eddie Murphy? You made me watch it as part of our Christmas movie marathon. What does that have to do with... I raised my hand to stop her. Besides being one of the greatest films ever made, there is a strong philosophical question at the heart of the film. I continued, knowing that Vivian was more than a little puzzled as to where I was going with this. Mortimer and Randolph Dukes argued about nature versus nurture. They wondered if it was simple genetics or upbringing that allowed a person to succeed, so they conducted a small experiment to see which one was right. I could see that Vivian was getting more confused by the second, so I thought I should focus on this story for a bit. These guys were billionaires, so it was easy for them to conduct such an experiment. It would be almost impossible for a simple guy like me to set something like this into motion. Hypothetically speaking, an ordinary guy like me, given the right set of circumstances, could set up his own experiment. Vivian's patience apparently ran out along with her last sip of coffee as she exclaimed, Thomas, what the hell are you talking about? I thought it best not to look into her eyes as I continued. Let's say a normal guy, deeply in love with his wife and excitedly awaiting the arrival of his first child, hears a terrible, terrible rumor. One that seems to indicate that the woman he spent the last eight years of his life worshipping and building his life around was actually having an affair with some doctor where she worked. At these words, I heard Vivian sigh. Let's say this poor guy refused to believe these rumors. He believed so much in the strength of his wife's character and her love for him that he would not accept this disgusting insinuation until the wife of the said doctor showed him transcripts and photographs proving that his wife not only cheated on him, but that the child she was carrying was her lover's, and that since she and her asshole boyfriend couldn't get married until he finished filing a divorce from his current wife, she was planning on passing off the child as his, her husband, until she and her boyfriend can be together. The same doctor even laughingly mentioned receiving child support. I looked at the distraught Vivian and, looking her straight in the eyes, continued, of course he, all this is hypothetical, such bad people do not exist in the real world. When Vivian began to sob quietly, I continued further, now imagine that this poor guy is looking at the options available to him, and he doesn't like any of them, and this stupid son of a bitch just absolutely hates all the options that are open to him. Every night he comes home to his seemingly loving wife and watches her belly grow, and as her belly grows, his love for her dies. Day after day, inch by inch, he feels his heart growing colder. I looked at Vivian to see what she thought of my story, but she continued to cry quietly, her elbows on the table and her head in her hands. But then, in the midst of his agony, a wonderful Christmas movie gives him an idea. Suddenly, a sense of purpose pierces his miasma of sadness. And from that day on, he moves towards his goal with a drive that surprises even himself. He may not be as smart as the hospital's chief executive, although just between you and me, Vivian, 
he went out of his way to pay for her graduate school tuition or the ER doctor, but he was still pretty smart. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, of course, that he becomes friends with all the nurses and staff who will be delivering babies, working in the hospital nursery, and even on the newborn care team. Heck, he might even be with them at Christmas parties in hospital, accompanying his wife. He may see them many times as part of childbirth classes. He may even have met some of them for coffee as a nervous dad-to-be in need of reassurance. Well, Vivian, I don't need to tell a smart man like you that such a man with the help of a vengeful doctor's wife, might have a chance to do something to finally prove the great hypothesis of Mortimer and Randolph Duke. I think at this point Vivian began to understand where this story was going. She was smart, and suddenly her sobs slowed down and stopped. Let's assume that this great visionary somehow managed to hide from his wife that she was literally killing his heart every day, desecrating every memory the couple had, desperately hoping for his support, planning to gut him personally and financially until that moment, as soon as she and her lover can agree to be together. Once again, Vivian, this is a completely fictional story. Such monsters were invented to scare small children. I'm sure none of us could think of someone so heartless, so wicked, that they would do this to someone they supposedly loved. Vivian chimed in with sadness in her voice. I thought I was in love, I completely lost myself in him, and I didn't. I stopped her again with a quick shake of my head. Hush, Vivian. You're ruining the story, and I'm just getting to the good part. Well, our hero, driven by his only scientific goal. Everything was in place now. He just needed to get things started. Luckily for him, his wife no longer cared about him at all. Otherwise, she would have seen the darkness, which from time to time enveloped him in deep depression and only a sense of scientific duty kept him afloat. Vivian now looked at me with something akin to horror as I told my story. Her hands no longer trembled with nervousness, and the tears dried on her cheeks as she waited with morbid horror for what to continue. Our hero was under great pressure, since now everything had to happen quickly. Finally, in the hospital, the husband waits patiently for the birth of his not-son, he made sure to find out the gender of the baby, even though his wife preferred the gender of the baby to be a surprise. He had experienced enough surprises in his entire life. As a woman who has worked in hospitals most of her life, Vivian, you probably know that safety back then wasn't the same as it is now, and our hero was almost surprised at how easy it all was to do. By throwing a small celebration with humorous gifts and cupcakes for those involved in the birth, our hero was able to distract everyone long enough to allow his accomplice to get to work. Theoretically, his assistant could have been the doctor's wife who felt that her inability to have children may have led to her husband conceiving a child with a prostitute with whom he worked. Vivian visibly winced at my description as I continued. Imagine the level of excitement our hero, Vivian, must have felt. He was about to complete the Mortimer and Randolph experiment on a much more basic level, replacing the newborn child of two very well-educated professionals with baby 16 years dependent, a girl who uses illegal substances, and her friend with the same addiction. He was finally going to... It was the crash of a chair that let me know that Vivian had fainted. And although I may not have rushed to her aid immediately, I eventually brought her back to her place with a glass of cold water from the toilet cistern. Although I wasn't sure that Vivian was completely with me at this moment, since her glassy, unfocused gaze and the repeated tick on her cheek were my indicators, this story had to finally be told to the end. As I said, Vivian, our hero, has finally achieved his ultimate goal. It should have been a moment of great celebration, and for a brief moment, it was. But then he made the mistake of looking into the room where he saw his soon-to-be ex-wife recovering from a 12-hour labor. A huge wave of affection and nostalgia washed over him. And just like that he ended it? He asked himself this difficult question. The thought of taking away something that was so important to someone he loved so much suddenly became unbearable, and he decided to make things right then and there. But... And Vivian... You're going to want to hear this part because it's really important to this hypothetical story. 
Just when he was about to finish his experiment, something happened that allowed him to fulfill his purpose and led to events that have been going on for 18 years until you arrived here today. Just as he was about to walk up to his wife and tell her everything he had done, a doctor in a medical uniform entered the room from another door. Vivian looked worried as I continued. As he watched the doctor walk up to the woman on the bed and kiss her on the lips, the hero became poor again, watching his wife turn to her lover with pride in her eyes as the two of them shared the moment of the birth of their child. I looked back at Vivian and saw that her eyes were squeezed shut, as if she was mentally trying to undo the story. At that moment, Vivian, our hero, was reborn. Like a phoenix from the ashes, all the feelings he once had for his bitch wife were completely and irrevocably erased in a rampage of fire. At this point, his commitment to the Duke brothers' legacy was strengthened, and his path was clear. Vivian looked at me with horror-filled eyes when she finally managed to mutter, How... How could you do something like that to me and my poor baby? Her eyes begged me to explain to her, so I did my best. Well, Vivian, when you deal with a child's DNA, are you talking about 100%, 50%, or 0%? I wanted the child to be 100% of our DNA. You wanted him to be 50% of our DNA. And in the end, it turned out to be 0% of our DNA. None of us actually got what we wanted. I smiled encouragingly hoping she would understand my apparently reasonable logic. I saw that Vivian's brain was desperately trying to break through the clutter created by my revelation. As I noted earlier, other than turning into a terrible person, she was always very smart. It only took her a few moments to get to the point. The only way to know the result of your experiment is if you know what both children turned out to be like. You just found out how Benjamin is doing, she didn't finish her sentence, instead looking at me questioningly. Well, hypothetically speaking, the experiment did not work quite as our hero expected. It turned out that the son of a 16-year-old girl with an addiction was already ready for adoption at that moment. Hypothetically speaking, he grew up happily in a middle-class family and is currently a sophomore in college, where he hopes to become a lawyer. If he goes through with this and becomes a lawyer, he will be, in the hero's humble opinion, in a much better position than Benjamin. I didn't think Vivian agreed with my view of the situation, and I could see the wheels turning as she tried to figure out a way to get what she wanted. Do you know what college he goes to? She asked, hopefully. I answered, I don't know. You can put your DNA into the registry and see if he can find his biological parents, if he wants to look, of course. Other than that, you will never hear another word from me again. In any case, this is all hypothetical, I concluded with a smile. Plus, I added, you have a son whom you and your lover have been raising for the last 18 years. Let's not forget about Benjamin. Of course, of course, Vivian muttered, slowly walking towards the door. Knowing how long her loyalty to me and our marriage lasted, once she saw what she considered best, I had a strong feeling that Benjamin would soon be on his own. Walking out the front door, Vivian turned to me. Thomas, for what it's worth, I'm truly sorry. Until you explained it to me, I didn't let her finish. Vivian, it's okay. I'd like to think that the last 18 years of fighting between you and Jerry while raising someone else's troubled child has made us equal. Vivian began to return my guileless smile with one of her own before she thought about what I said and her smile turned into a frown. Before she could ask how I knew what was going on in their marriage, I had already turned to the TV and closed the door. Maybe I'll make it in time for the second half of the match. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.